Hello everyone and welcome back after the lunch break, the diehards of the last afternoon of the Peer Review Congress. Um, this afternoon we are in pre and post publication issues and um, I'm told we have to run absolutely to time so I will simply say that our first speaker is Stiliano Sergi from Stanford who's going to talk ab about associations between bioarchive, preprint, non-citation attention and publication in the biomedical literature. Um, hello, uh, my name is uh, Stelio Sergiu. I'm a physician and a first year uh, PhD student at Stanford University. Um, we're all here because we're really, really interested in making science great again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, many, many publications over the past few years have shown that scientific um, research has not been up to par as far as quality is concerned. Um, one of the ways we can mitigate that is obviously by improving and innovating in peer review. Uh, but peer review does not come without its limitations. So preprints arose to save the day. And uh, the most popular preprint repository in biology is BioArchive. So this project that I will be presenting today arose by our own ignorance in what is BioArchive. I mean, who publishes in BioArchive? Do people pay attention to preprints? Do they ever get published? Do they hear journals when they do? So we'll find out. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll start with some vocabulary first, just to be absolutely sure that everyone is on the same page. Um, a preprint is the version of a paper that has not yet reached peer-reviewed publication. Um, Preprints were actually proposed very early on in the 1900s, but were first uh, convincingly uh, done by archive in 1990s. And then in the 2000s, the first uh, repositories specific to biology arose. Now, BioArchive was established in 2013 by Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. And since then, it has established itself as by far the most popular such repository. Um, we will be studying those preprints and the attention they receive using Altmetric. What Altmetric does is it goes through social media such as Facebook, Twitter, and the mainstream media. It identifies mentions of papers, and then it quantifies that and combines it into a composite uh, attention score. So let's begin. We visited by archive on the 17th of January, 2017. Uh, when we found 7,760 records. Uh, 7,750 of those were unique, and out of those, 2,628 had actually been published. Out of those, we could find on PubMed 2,574. The records we found on BioArchive, as well as the records we found on PubMed, will be our sample. So what did we find? Well, BioArchive wasn't really off to a good start initially. Ah, my, my slides are not showing very well. So initially, it, it only saw roughly around 60 um, preprints per, per month. And it's grown exponentially to more than 600 preprints uploaded per month. Um, most of the preprints tend to come from um, slightly more computationally savvy um, disciplines. And in fact, if you take bioinformatics, evolutionary biology, um, neurobiology, and genomics together, they account for more than 50% of the preprints on BioArchive. Now, do these ever get published? In fact, to my initial surprise, may I say, they do. Uh, it, 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 it seems that roughly 50 to 60% of the preprints on BioArchive will eventually reach canonical publication. However, if you see on your left, only roughly 23% of the preprints published or uploaded to BioArchive in 2016 actually have been published. And that's because if you look to your right, it takes roughly six to nine months from availability to BioArchive to eventual publication. Now, who reads these things? Um, well, it seems that the median abstract is viewed roughly a thousand times, and the median PDF is viewed roughly 350 to 400 times. Now, that varies greatly from PDFs that are actually viewed zero times 
which seems that the author even is not really interested in them, uh, <laughs> to, to other um, preprints that receive more than 150,000 views. This is um, not, again, very um, democratically um, distributed. And again, more computationally savvy uh, disciplines tend to receive more views than the others. Uh, you can also see on your right, it doesn't show well at all. Uh, but what I was trying to show there is that uh, these views have been increasing over the years, even though the variance is too large to make any statistical inference. Now, do they receive much attention as far as altmetric attention score is concerned? This doesn't show at all. Uh, so what the left uh, graph was supposed to show is a histogram of um, the altmetric attention score. The median altmetric attention score is 7, and the mean altmetric attention score is 14. Now, to put that in context, a altmetric says that if a paper receives an altmetric attention score of more than 20, then that paper is doing really, really well, much better than average. If you take the preprints on BiArchive, roughly 20% of those actually receive an altmetric attention score of more than 20. That, again, varies a lot with subject area. And areas such as uh, genomics and bioinformatics tend to receive a lot more attention than areas such as uh, pathology, pharmacology, and toxicology, apparently. Uh, now, how does attention vary in more detail? Um, it seems that it doesn't vary that much by year of publication. However, it varies hugely by subject area. And it varies wi with whether the preprint has actually been published or not. Now, we went a step further. And w what we did is we said, OK, what if that preprint gets published? Does it receive more attention when it actually gets published? It seems that it does. Its metric attention score actually increases by roughly 14 points from being a preprint to actually being a postprint. And this is mainly driven by changes in attention in the mainstream media, Facebook, and Twitter. The last thing we wanted to do, though, is something else, even cooler. So we said, OK, let's take those articles from the canonical literature that have been a previous preprint and compare them to articles from the same subject area in the same journal at the same time and see whether they receive a kind of different attention. Um, to do that, we identified a random sample from our initial um, signatures of specific journals, times, and issues. And we eventually ended up with roughly 340 preprints matched to roughly one to five um, non-X preprints. And the results are here. So what we found was really surprising, to me at least. It seems that if an article has been on BiArchive, when it gets published, it receives a lot more attention than articles that had never been on BiArchive. In fact, on average, the preprint is in the top 30% as far as Altmetric is concerned, whereas articles that had never been on BiArchive are in the top 50%. That's mainly driven by Twitter. But you can also see, if you avoid Altmetric and just look at citations taken from Crossref, even as far as citations are concerned, X preprints tend to receive more citations than non-X preprints. Um, in what we did, there were a huge amount of limitations. And the three most important, as far as I'm concerned, is that BiArchive is an evolving platform. So what applies today may not apply tomorrow. Um, two, the association that we saw with BiArchive and being an ex-preprint um, is most probably confounded by other factors. And number three, BiArchive represents mostly uh, papers from disciplines such as bioinformatics and genomics, and those may not um, generalize well to other disciplines. So take home messages. BiArchive is quite popular and rapidly evolving. Preprints on BiArchive attract significant attention, and they eventually reach canonical publication. And when they do, they tend to receive more attention than articles that had never been on BiArchive. 
Um, I would like to thank my advisor, uh, Johnny Anidis, and all of my code and data will be on my GitHub as of after the Congress. <laughs> thank you very much. We're open for questions, and I'll take Chair's prerogative and ask the first one. Um, I wonder whether what you're seeing is that immediately post-publication, things are more rapidly cited and get attention, but that actually in the long term, there won't be any effect. Because I can imagine that if I know there's something that's a preprint and now it's published and I cite it sooner than I might otherwise have been aware of it. But mm, Yeah, th that's definitely true. And I guess we could po possibly look at that by studying um, papers over different kinds of years to see whether we, we see any difference in effect size. But yeah, that's a very good comment, yes. Hi, I have just two very quick questions. Um, one, I was wondering if you have any data on whether a preprint gets more views on BioArchive before and after publication, because you've talked about alt metrics, et cetera, but do more people look at it on BioArchive once it's been published? Um, unofficially, not really. Um, the the kind of um, trajectory that views receive is sort of really high initially, and it tails off quite quickly. And unofficially, I did look at whether it increases after it gets published, and I didn't see much of a difference there. Uh, but I haven't done the analysis to know exactly whether there is even a tiny difference. OK, and then my second question was, are there any measures or ways to look at or thoughts about how to look at, I mean, we, we talk about the preprint as if it's just a, an early version of the published paper, but what the differences actually are between a preprint and a published paper in terms of the science it's in, it doesn't change through peer review or does it not? I mean, mm -hmm. how do, any thoughts about how we might start to look at that? Um, uh, yeah, that, that'd be a, a definitely a really good thing to do. Uh, from my experience, that at least the title, it really doesn't change that much at all. Um, we haven't studied whether the actual science in the paper changes, and that would be great to do, and probably future um, work for us. Because yeah, I'm just curious, when we talk about like more Twitter, more social media, is that about, I mean, in some cases, the science can change a lot, and is it tweeting and social media about the preprint science, or the published paper science, or do, does nobody care if they're different, or, and how do we think about that then? Uh, you know, what is the, I mean, otherwise we could then really do away with peer review if the preprint is identical in most cases to the published paper and it hasn't changed. Yeah. We, it, we don't need to do much then beyond the preprint. <laughs> it depends a lot on the authors as well. A different people may use BioArchive very differently. For example, some people go through lots of versions of their preprint, whereas others go through one version. And also some people even upload their preprint on BioArchive after actually its publication. Mm -hmm. yeah. So as you can see, different people use it very differently. OK, thank you. Okay. Hi, Jessica Polka from ASAP Bio. Uh, I think that preprinting is very popular on Twitter. There's a lot of a, it seems to be a kind of bubble of pro <laughs> preprinting uh, sentiments. Uh, so when you selected your control group of papers, um, it, are these, I, I understand they're from the same journals, but are, or did you select for authors with the same social media profile? Because this could clearly influence their uh, influence. Uh, it, it could definitely do so, yes. And to be honest, I mean, um, if, you, if you think about it, they were in the exact same um, journal. So I would expect that the same sort of authors um, that are publishing these kind of um, um, preprints would also be publishing the others, so I wouldn't expect much difference between them. But yeah, there's, uh, there's a lot of possible explanations to what we saw. Thanks. Okay. Hi, Chris Blaumuller from the University of Iowa. Um, so I, I know of a paper that was uploaded onto BioArchive with a really exciting title, but very little data. So I was just wondering if, um, so I think you said there were 50% that got published in the time that you were looking? Oh, uh, roughly 50 to 60, yes. Yeah. So is there any concern that a large chunk of those will stay unpublished because people kind of gave up on them, but they kind of wanted to mark that territory or anything <laughs> like that? <laughs> um, maybe there is. Uh, definitely papers that, were, that came on by archive from 2014, which is roughly four years until now, have not, get, have not been published. And probably never will. Um, I don't know why people may have done that, and I don't know what the impact of that may be, but that also applies to archive, and uh, people have not re really been complaining about that from 
th those kinds of disciplines. Are there any more questions that I'm not seeing? If not, we'll say thank you very much. Thank you.